Imagine that you're leaving this TEDx event this afternoon, and you make a decision that you make every day, like you decide to go home and walk your dog. This is the sort of routine decision that I made on June 17th of 2013, a little over two years ago. You see, I was working at a family medicine clinic that's not far from here, actually, a couple miles away. And I drove home to the suburbs of Philadelphia, where I was living with my family, and uh, took my dog to a local site to walk along a stream. I knew there were some rock formations in that area, so I knew we'd probably be hiking around. And I remember speaking to my family before I left the home and uh, parking our car near this stream. I remember taking the dog for a bit of a walk and then tying his leash up around a tree. The last thing I remember is looking up at a sheet of rock that was almost 30 or 40 feet high. It's probably an abandoned quarry. I've spent a lot of time trying to remember exactly what happened that afternoon, um, though I've spent that time unsuccessfully. I may have been hiking along the top of this abandoned quarry, may have been trying to climb it. I don't exactly remember. What I do know is that I'm very lucky that my dog Riley was with me because I did fall. I may have fallen between 10 and 40 feet. I broke my back and he presumably started barking, attracted a family uh, that was fishing in the stream nearby to my aid. They called 911 and I was taken to the local emergency department. I was medevaced eventually to Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, where I was a medical student at the time. As you can imagine, this was obviously an unwelcome surprise and change in circumstance for me as a 26-year-old male, very active, athletic, and uh, I woke two weeks later in the hospital in the intensive care unit, surrounded by my family. I remember feeling lucky that I had a family that was so supportive and that was at my bedside because not all patients do. I remember also being surrounded by my team of care providers and remember the attending physician walking into the room, sitting down by my bed and explaining to me that I had broken my back, that I had severed my spinal cord 95% of the way through. He analogized things and explained to me that my spinal cord was almost like a stalk of celery which, as you know, when you break it, there are sometimes those few fibers connecting the upper and lower portions before you rip those two parts of, apart. And I had a few nerve fibers that were connecting the upper and lower portions of my cord, but I would never be able to move my legs again. I would never be able to walk, surf, run. These were all things that I loved to do. And I wouldn't be able to feel my legs either. I'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I remember that feeling of dis-ease as I lie in my hospital bed as a patient for the first time and would move, but my legs wouldn't and would feel things with my hands that my feet couldn't. And I remember at that moment what it felt to become a patient with a chronic and life-changing healthcare condition. Now we're all patients, but patienthood means different things to different people. For some people it means interacting with your doctor or nurse or physician's assistant every day. Other people, it means an annual exam with your primary care physician, maybe in order to get a PPD placed. But my perception of doctors and patients both changed while I was in the hospital. You see, doctors had been those people with whom I was training that were mentoring me as a medical student. The first two years of medical school were spent largely learning the basics of biomedicine about how the body works and how it breaks when it is afflicted by disease. You enter your third year and are trained with clinicians, with uh, exposure to many different medical specialties, the idea being that you will choose your medical specialty and sort of fall in love with the medical profession, apply for a residency program in your fourth year, and begin your career. I remember thinking of doctors as competent, hopefully intelligent, hopefully, and when I was a patient, they became those figures at the foot of my bed, sterile, white coat clad, talking amongst themselves and coming up with a plan of care, deciding exactly what we would do for the day. Sometimes they would involve me in these discussions and other times they wouldn't. Sometimes they would ask for my opinion, other times they wouldn't. Sometimes they would use medical jargon that was unfamiliar to me as a third year medical student and we would come up with this plan of care. Sometimes they would wake me up at 6, 8 or 11 a.m. if I was lucky enough to sleep in because they were rounding on me last. And I remember thinking that patients are oftentimes viewed as vulnerable, 
weak, needing, disabled, all the things that patients should not be viewed as because we need engaged patients in our healthcare system. Of course, I learned a couple of other things while I was in the hospital, some more lighthearted. I remember learning how much my family could eat during periods of immense emotional instability. <laughs> People would bring me all kinds of great stuff to my bedside, brownies, cookies, you name it. But I was enveloped in this cocoon of support by my family that also served as a barrier for all things sweet. They uh, would eat everything up before it ever got to me. <laughs> and uh, this probably shouldn't have surprised me, but <laughs> I um, had broken my jaw as part of my fall, and my mouth was wired shut. So really, they were protecting me. Um, my fiance, who I'm marrying next week, um, she would bring me uh, my favorite sandwiches from all over Philadelphia, pulled porks from Denix, steaks from Jake's, lobster rolls from Luke's, you name it, and then would bring them to me and remember that I couldn't eat them. You see, I was feeding myself at that time by pureeing food and injecting it into the back of my throat with a syringe around the teeth that were wired shut. So she would eat it for me in front of me, and I would say, please, can you stop eating that? But they did it in my best interest. I remember thinking at that time that it was interesting that the people who were taking care of me most often were the house staff, the residents, fellows, and early career attending physicians in the hospital, in addition to the medical students like me, who were spending night and day in the hospital and taking care of me, but were oftentimes probably those people for whom it was least familiar to be a patient with a chronic healthcare condition. They're the youngest people in the hospital. By virtue of being young, generally have the fewest medical problems. You see, as clinicians, for the most part, we learn about the healthcare system through experience as providers and aren't oftentimes at least patients while we're training. So those people that were in direct uh, care were oftentimes those people that knew least what it meant to be a patient. I would tell them things that were concerning to me, like things to do with my clinical care, what drugs I would be taking for different complications of my spinal cord injury, but I would also vocalize to them concerns of mine that were non-clinical, like how I would pay for those drugs when I left the hospital, whether the insurance I had purchased prior was going to be sufficient, and if not, and I would need to get supplementary insurance through Medicaid, which I qualified for as a student with zero income and immense amounts of debt, whether that would be sufficient as well, and they oftentimes didn't know the answers. It occurred to me that it's very, very important that we as medical students, residents, fellows, and early career attending physicians really do understand these non-clinical drivers of patient care and of healthcare delivery at large. Recently, I was speaking with a fellow a resident at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, where I now practice, and this surgical resident needed disability insurance for his hands. As a surgical resident, his hands are going to be his livelihood. If he cannot operate, he won't be able to pay back those immense amount of student debt or make any money. So he needed a policy. He went out searching for one. But during his medical school experience, he had been under a period of immense stress related to his medical studies and had seen a psychiatrist prescribed him an anti-anxiety medication that he had actually never taken, but because this prescription was in his medical record, he was precluded from many of the disability policies that he was seeking out. This was eye-opening to him because it showed him the power of prescription and the supply that doctors oftentimes push upon their patients, the consequences thereof. I think it's incredibly important that our young physicians, the next generation of physician leaders, understand these sorts of things. I feel fortunate to have practiced at uh, two excellent institutions, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and Jefferson in Philadelphia that do understand this need and have educated students and residents appropriately. In our residency program at the Brigham, we have a separate track to teach medical residents about managerial leadership because we are all, as physicians, leaders of multidisciplinary care teams. Gone are the days of autonomous physicians that are making decisions in isolation. Clinical care does not exist in that vacuum any longer. We are part of teams and are really realizing that we have always been. We need to be able to manage those teams. Um, at Jefferson, we started a program called the IDEA program. IDEA stands for Innovation and Design Application. 
in order to attract uh, students from their undergraduate universities with non-traditional healthcare backgrounds. Like myself, I'm a molecular biology major. We need less of me in medicine and more people who have trained in public policy, architecture, engineering, those sorts of non-traditional disciplines in order to elevate the level of discourse surrounding how we are going to solve these problems that healthcare today faces. We started a student organization called the Physician Executive Leadership Program that serves to teach medical students about the sorts of things that I now feel as though they need to know, like healthcare policy and federal regulation of healthcare, how CMS works. I think we should probably all know this as, as residents, seeing as they are, they are paying our hospitals to pay us. Uh, we need to understand the business of medicine and healthcare entrepreneurship, how healthcare is oftentimes driven by business interests. And doctors can be manipulated by those interests at times. So we need to understand that. We need to understand the pipeline of clinical innovation that brings innovations to the bedside for patients. Not only drugs, not only the bench to bedside sort of clinical translational research that we're familiar with right now, but also how durable medical equipment and processes are developed and offered to patients. I remember as a patient, I would wonder what the next clinical innovation would be that would help me improve my mobility, be it a wheelchair or some sort of stand-up power wheelchair. These things are incredibly important to patients. I think it's also important that we understand how to improve our, our processes through lean methodology and quality improvement measures because outcomes are driving healthcare now. You see, now more than ever, healthcare is in upheaval and the next generation of physician leaders, something that a few colleagues and I have referred to as the Med X generation, X standing for the sort of inherent uncertainty that we feel right now, given all of the changes afoot. Our generation really needs to understand these things. A few colleagues and I are creating a platform called Med X to teach medical students, residents, and fellows about the non-clinical drivers of healthcare. We need to understand these things so we can better serve our patients. I think that I feel encouraged now because our generation, our med X generation, if you will, really does understand that clinical care does not exist in a vacuum and needs to be alongside non-clinical care in terms of our education and training, those non-clinical drivers that I mentioned. At the same time, the patient is more engaged nowadays than the patient has ever been, and I've learned this by becoming a patient myself. We're all patients and part of this healthcare system, and we need to treat it as such. I think that we need to become more engaged by asking our doctors the right questions, by becoming more informed as to our clinical conditions, and by seeking out ways in which we can prevent medical problems that may occur to us in the future. So I come to you with this positive and encouraging message that our next generation of physician leaders is learning. We're constantly learning about how to improve the care of patients. But we, as patients, also need to be more engaged. And with more engaged patients and better educated physician leaders, I see a brighter future for healthcare tomorrow. Thank you very much.